nem egyszerű örökölni valamit az Európai Unióban, főleg, hogyha az ügyben több ország jogrendje is közre játszik. Egy lengyel-francia eset például már a tizedik évét is elérte. A következő riportunkból ezt a történetet ismerhetik meg. Avant sa mort en Pologne, Jan Bednarczyk ne se doutait peut-être pas des complications qu'entraînerait sa succession. Jan était propriétaire d'une maison dans le sud-est de la Pologne, près de la ville de Stalova Vola. Dans son testament, il décide de tout donner à une de ses trois filles, Alexandra. Contrairement à d'autres pays européens, la Pologne prévoit qu'un des héritiers puisse recevoir l'entièreté d'un héritage. Być może wyposażył je w ich za życia I, i taki testament jako jego wola jest tutaj zgodny z prawem i pewnie też i z, z poczuciem sprawiedliwości. Cette succession en Pologne est donc réglée quelques mois après la mort de Jan. En 2001, à la mort de sa mère, résidant en France, Jan a hérité en partie d'une maison et d'un terrain situé en région parisienne près de Melun. Mais comme Yann est mort en 2006 et qu'à ce moment, la succession française n'est toujours pas terminée, ce sont les trois sœurs polonaises qui héritent en partie des biens français. Problème, Yann a tout donné à une de ses filles sur son testament en Pologne. La loi française interdit cette pratique. Résultat, le dossier se complique. Maître Gilles Krowicki est le quatrième notaire français à s'occuper de cette succession. La succession immobilière est réglée en France est soumise en France à la loi de situation de l'immeuble. Je dois donc, en ma qualité de notaire français, régler la succession de M. Yann B. conformément à la loi française. Et je dois assurer l'exécution du testament rédigé par M. Yann B. dans le respect de la réserve héréditaire prévue par la loi française au profit des deux autres filles du défunt. En d'autres termes, malgré la volonté de Yann, ces trois filles doivent recevoir une partie des biens situés en France. Retour en Pologne, nous avons rencontré Alexandra, une des trois sœurs. Elle est en colère car elle ne comprend pas pourquoi cette succession traîne depuis dix ans. Ce n'est qu'après ce tournage qu'elle a bien voulu nous en parler au téléphone. I do tej pory ta sprawa się nie kończy. No nie wiadomo kto to, kto i co ukrywa. W 2008 rokuśmy były. We Francji miało być to zakończone. Powiedzieli nam, że w przeciągu do trzech miesięcy pieniądze ze spadków wpłyną na nasze konta. En plus des trois sœurs polonaises, trois autres héritiers français ont droit légitimement à leur part du gâteau. Située à 50 km de Paris, cette maison et son terrain valent beaucoup d'argent. Venceslas est un des trois héritiers français. Pour lui, il y a urgence à vendre. Euh, ce terrain va être un terrain à construire qui sera vendu à une personne qui attend ce terrain depuis pas mal de temps. Et nous avons des acquéreurs pour la maison aussi qui attendent ce terrain, cette, cette maison pour en faire les travaux dedans, pour y vivre. Ce cas de succession fait partie des 450 000 successions internationales ouvertes dans l'Union européenne. Un patrimoine estimé à plus de 120 milliards d'euros annuels. Le droit des successions se règle via des conventions bilatérales signées entre les différents États membres pour, entre autres, éviter la double imposition fiscale. Pour simplifier cette matière, l'Union est en train de plancher sur des règles communes au 27. This regulation could bring a harmonization of the conflict of law rules. That means harmonization insofar as we know which law applies. And it gives the testator within certain limits, the possibility to determine the applicable law in his last will and testament. Le dossier franco-polonais devrait néanmoins se débloquer rapidement. Wenceslas a fait appel à Maître Krowicki. Ce notaire français connaît bien le droit polonais de par ses origines polonaises et a des contacts privilégiés avec les notaires de ce pays, un atout essentiel. Ce dossier dure depuis dix ans, je crois qu'il ne verra pas la onzième année. Mi történik, hogyha az Európai Unió egy tagországát támadás éri? A tagállam feladata, hogy megvédje magát, vagy pedig a többi ország is besegít? Egyáltalán hány katonája van az Európai Uniónak, és mi az ő feladatuk? Milyen kihívások várnak rájuk a jövőben? Következő riportunk megadja a válaszokat.
With a geopolitical landscape in a flux, what is Europe's roadmap for the future? Does it need to rethink its collective security and defence policy? And by doing so, will it then create an impenetrable EU fortress? Time to take a closer look. We're here at a Belgian army base in Leopoldsburg to talk to Colonel Sassel to learn a little bit more about what armies do and the security challenges facing Europe. The base at Leopoldsburg is also where an EU battle group trains. In 2013, the first time in, in, in almost five to ten years, uh, Europe talked about defence and they said defence matters. And they were looking at three different strengths. We were looking at strengths uh, as visibility, capacity and industry. Europe still lacks uh, strategic capacities. The origins of a collective defence policy date as far back as the 1940s. It started with the Treaty of Brussels, signed in 1948 and amended in 1954 in Paris. It was implemented by a new military organisation, the Western European Union. The most important idea of the treaty was in Article 5, the idea of coming to the aid of another under attack. Following the Cold War and Balkan conflicts, European leaders took a decisive step to develop collective capabilities. Capabilities that included the creation of a credible military force. But it wasn't until the 2009 Lisbon Treaty that things really kicked off. The Common Security and Defence Policy, or CSDP, was created with solidarity serving as an impetus for joint action. The treaty created an umbrella organisation, the European External Action Service, under the reins of an already existing EU High Representative for Security and Foreign Affairs. The post is currently held by Federica Mogherini. The EEAS includes a military staff. The objective in all these trends and lines of action is to make best use of member states' resources, the most effective use for member states and for the European Union in the context of their contributions. One concrete step is Eurocorps, with five EU members and based in Strasbourg, but it's not the only one. Missions under the CSDP are widespread. U4 is the umbrella label for the European Union force. So far, some 15 civilian and military peacekeeping missions with soldiers from various member states have been completed. The same amount are currently underway in, say, for example, Ukraine, Mali and the Palestinian territories. The CSDP only allows the financing of civilian missions. Military or defence operations have to be financed by member states. Their contributions to a defence budget of sorts, 190 billion euros. But the problem with the 28 countries collective, member states see defence as a matter of strict national sovereignty, so there's duplication of equipment, resources and personnel. But the European Parliament, and in particular its subcommittee on security and defence, is pushing for more oversight of the CSDP and are calling for an EU defence equipment market. Could that make a difference in the future? Well, there's definitely one thing that could make a huge difference, and it's something that has been discussed for decades. Has its time finally come? Of course, I'm talking about the idea bandied around by EU Federalists, the idea of an EU army. The thing is, is the EU actually has an army of sorts. Well, actually, when you look at the battle groups, uh, the battle groups from a military perspective, they're ready to go. It's just a rapid reaction for a crisis and an expected crisis. So you have to have those conditions because this is the concept of uh, using a battle group. First of all, you don't have, all member states don't necessarily have the same sensitivity, the same feeling about uh, the importance of the crisis. And on the other side, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of uh, financial uh, means. And that's always been its problem. Power and money struggles between member states have left them unused. Besides, their function is already served by NATO and UN peacekeeping troops. So it begs the question whether an EU army could ever really exist. It's like firemen. I mean, if you, if you don't have fire, would you, would you stop with having and training firemen? So uh, you have always to be ready. There's an old motto that says, united we stand, divided we fall. Since its inception, the European project has been about one thing, bringing its policies and people together. With common threats, they need common solutions if they are ever to break new ground on foreign and security policy. 
Az úgynevezett Juncker terv egy olyan elképzelés, ami új munkahelyeket teremtene és gazdasági növekedést hozna az Európai Unióban. Ráadásul mindezt rövid időn, mindössze három éven belül. Megmagyarázzuk, hogy hogyan működhet. Full name, the European Fund for Strategic Investments. No name, the Juncker Plan, or at least a big part of it. Financial target, 315 billion euros. Political target, to kickstart growth and jobs across the EU over the next three years. Why? Because Europe has been suffering from chronic underinvestment since the financial crisis. That's not a shortage of hard cash. Quite the opposite. Banks and corporations have no liquidity problems, just an aversion to risk parking it somewhere. EFSI aims to unblock that through a series of public and private investment initiatives in strategic projects. It works like this. The fund is kick-started by an allocation of 21 billion euros. 16 from the EU's budget, 5 from the EIB's reserve, both serving as guarantors. The rest, it's hoped, comes from a market spurred into action by the guarantees. The European Parliament successfully fought to reduce, by a billion euros, plans to raid existing programmes like Horizon 2020 and the Connecting Europe facility for the Guarantee Fund. It also won a say in selecting the fund's leadership and ensured more democratic oversight. MEPs rapidly approved EFSI in June, five months after its introduction, arguing it will give a major urgently needed boost to modernising Europe. Early contributors included Germany, Spain, France, Italy, Luxembourg, Poland, Slovakia and Bulgaria. What project areas exactly? The emphasis is on big infrastructure and supporting small and medium-sized enterprises, strategic digital and energy networks, renewables and energy efficiency, innovation and research, supporting education, to name just a few. If all goes to plan, 1.3 million new jobs could be created, a sizable reduction in the EU, where in May 2015 just over 23 million people were jobless, 11.1% of the workforce. The Commission has named the European Investment Bank as its implementer and strategic partner. The programme should be operational in 2015. Nyáron az Európai Parlament képviselői is szusztannak egyet, ősztől azonban sok munka vár rájuk. Egyebek mellett rendezniük kell a görög válságot és a migránsok ügyét. Napi renden lesz még a bioélelmiszerek kérdése, a levegőszennyezés és a vasutak is. A most következő összeállításból kiderül, hogy mi mindenre számíthatunk szeptembertől. Could the weather be any better for the last plenary session in Strasbourg before the holidays? But before we leave for the recess, here's a look at some of the big topics for autumn. Welcome to the agenda. It's been the biggest story. Could Greece make a deal with creditors and stay in the Eurozone? Here in Strasbourg at the last plenary session of the summer, MEPs invited Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. The tempers flared as them criticized the Prime Minister while others offered their advice. At the final hour, a deal was struck in Brussels and later passed by the Greek Parliament, but not without a bitter struggle. Tough months lie ahead. MEPs will continue to monitor the situation and some are even calling for a rethink of a Eurozone blueprint. The transatlantic trade deal has avoided the hangman's noose more times than you can count, but is it worth the fight? By doing away with regulatory barriers across a wide range of areas like manufacturing, food or transport, figures suggest that TTIP would boost the EU's economy by 120 billion euros or 0.5% of GDP and create millions of jobs. But critics argue that changes to the labour market could actually create unemployment, water down EU standards and lead to increased privatisation as US companies move in on public services. But the biggest snag is ISDS, the private arbitration mechanism where EU governments could be sued by private investors. The original ISDS method has been shot down by MEPs, but what form it now takes is still unclear. With choppy waters to navigate in the coming months, will Parliament give TTIP its seal of approval or banish it for good? 
Is Europe's obsession with security deadly? That's what protesters had to say when they staged a protest on the walkers outside the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg to show their solidarity with the thousands of migrants who have died trying to cross the waters of the Mediterranean into Europe. A tragedy that saw hundreds drown off the Mediterranean coast in April was the catalyst that finally galvanized European leaders to come up with a solution to the migrant crisis. But getting the action plan up and running has been no easy task. The sticking points were relocation in all EU member states of 40,000 migrants already arrived in Italy and Greece, and the resettlement of 20,000 refugees coming from third countries. You make it or you die. The finer details, how to go about doing this, are still to be decided. With some around the corner, MEPs gave consent to provide an extra 69.6 million euros of funding to Frontex to help manage the situation better. And in December, the Civil Liberties Committee will present their own initiative report to the plenary. And now for some stories expected to hit the headlines in the autumn. It's become trendy to go organic. The industry has expanded so rapidly in the last five years that better quality controls are needed. Labelling and other quality ensuring measures are on the way. It's a law that could redefine the food we eat. Novel foods, which could soon include algae, fungi and would you believe it, insects, will be subject to stricter safety measures with the Parliament voting on proposed legislation in October. Despite being shelved by the Commission, the air quality package could be making a return with a few tweaks. Could the air we breathe get cleaner? You'll have to find out in October. A morally corrupt but legal tax system that allows member states to give favourable tax breaks to multinationals could be set to change. In November, Parliament's Special Committee on Tax, set up in the wake of the Luxleaks scandal, will issue its recommendations. Could Europe give a helping hand to its flagging economy? One idea being proposed is a capital markets union by 2018. We'll find out more when the project gains momentum in October. The Civil Liberties Committee approved a draft passenger name record text that includes strong data protection safeguards. Negotiations with other institutions will begin shortly. The last step is sometimes hard to make. So too for the final pillar of the railway package reforms affecting domestic travel. Technical issues have now been resolved to expect movement on the right track next term. With CO2 levels rising dramatically, the environmental impact in the next 30 years could be devastating. The need for a global climate change agreement is now more than ever. Can it be reached in Paris? The big polluters like China and the US are finally on board, so it's looking positive that a global agreement can be reached to lower emissions. Will this be the last tango in Paris or will world leaders default on saving the environment? Wait and see in December. And that's all we have for this agenda. Take care and enjoy the holidays. A Pont EU 30. adását látták. Egy hét múlva is friss témával várjuk Önöket. Tartsanak velünk akkor is. Viszontlátásra!